Today, we are gonna follow along with this workbook right here. We are gonna TIG weld some aluminum corner joints. This workbook is absolutely free and it's amazing. You can download it right now and keep it forever. You'll need it for this episode. Let's get into what this is gonna cover here now. Okay, so we're gonna use the Canaweld 201 Pulse D here today, and we're gonna keep it super simple as far as the settings go, let's program it right now. The first thing that we're gonna program here is amperage. Amperage is obviously gonna be the amount of heat that we are using as we are welding. You can take a look at this chart right here. This is an amperage chart that's included in my online program. Obviously it changes depending on what thickness of material you're using, but this chart kind of gives you a ballpark of what you wanna use for something like this. Generally, I like to set my amperage to have about 10 extra amps or so because I like my starts nice and hot. The next thing I usually like setting up right away is my balance. Balance is very important because it's gonna help you out with a few different things. Obviously this machine is set for alternating current. That's what you need when you're doing aluminum TIG welding because we need the positive side of the AC cycle to clear away any surface oxide on the aluminum. That's just what happens. As you increase the positive side of the AC cycle, you're gonna see that your welding starts to get shinier, which is cool, but you're gonna to start to notice that the tip of your tungsten is gonna to start to wobble or flutter or become misshapen. On the flip side of this, we can have an inadequate amount of positive, so excessive amounts of negative side it'll mean that your tungsten is obviously more stable and this will work really well for running a pointed or blunted tungsten but what's going to happen is your weld is going to start to appear sandy or grainy it's going to be different for every type of welding machine that you use every type of welding job that you're actually doing so just do your research as far as what is a good setting for it with your machine the next setting i like to program is my frequency now typically with something like this i'm going to program it for about 100 to 120 hertz give or take adjusting your frequency is only possible when you're welding with an inverter type machine like like this little cutie right here. But essentially why I like doing this is it changes and shapes your arc cone. Sometimes you can tighten up the arc cone quite a bit. Obviously this helps with something like an outside corner joint immensely. Like I mentioned, I set it somewhere in between 100 to 120 hertz. This is gonna be perfect for a good amount of heat focused down into the joint. Hopefully we'll get some good penetration. Now the other important setting that we're gonna do here is our post flow. Post flow is essentially the amount of time that your gas is gonna cycle for after you finish a welding pass. Typically, I like running a lot of post flow just to be on the safe side. As you're welding hotter stuff, you're gonna to wanna to increase this value to a longer amount of time. But like we're doing here today, we're just doing some thinner stuff, so we don't need to set it quite as long. Typically, give or take, I like setting it somewhere between six to eight seconds, just to be safe. But when I finish the weld, I'm gonna show you some really important stuff about how to post flow properly. Make sure you stick around for that part in the lesson here. Now, the settings of up slope as well as down slope here. It's not really going to be necessary for me because I'm using a foot pedal with my machine. If you're welding with a foot pedal, obviously you can just leave these set at zero. But if you're using something like a thumb trigger to initiate your arc on your torch, you don't have a foot pedal, the settings of up slope and down slope become very important. Typically, I prefer a pretty slow arc on setting as far as up slope goes. It's gonna to help to establish things nice and smooth as you get going, nothing too sudden. And then I prefer an even slower arc off when I finish. Again, you'll have to do research as far as what works best for your setup. Now for the gas that we're using on the machine over here on the cylinder, I'm gonna be using a gas lens on my torch, which gives me a much better spread of the welding area. I'm gonna set it somewhere around 15 CFH, give or take. Okay, so for the demonstration, this is the type of torch that I'm gonna be using right here. For whatever torch that you're using, make sure you check out what the torch is rated for as far as an amperage rating. And you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you take a look at the workbook, because this is gonna show you how to properly assemble all of your consumables for whatever torch type you are using. And again, there's different types of torches and different types of consumables. So make sure you check out that page in the workbook. Okay, so the next section that the book's gonna cover is gonna be about safety. The first thing you obviously want if you're doing any welding is you wanna make sure you have a proper designated TIG welding helmet. It doesn't have to be a fancy auto darkening one, just something that works properly, has new batteries in it. Make sure that there is no light leaking from anywhere in it. Now, another thing I recommend is always to make sure that you're wearing eye protection. Obviously, when I'm doing my demonstrations for my channel here, I'm usually not wearing eye protection. But especially if you are learning in an environment where there's other people around you who are working, I've seen it Many times, people working next to you, you may think that you're safe and it's all good. And what can happen is the end of somebody's filler material as they turn around to look at something, it can poke you in the eye. I've seen it happen. So especially if you're working around other people, make sure you wear eye protection. You're gonna wanna make sure that you have proper gloves with no holes or tears in them. I love using these gloves here from Defiant Metal. These are absolutely my favorite. And of course, you wanna make sure that you wear breathing protection like a respirator or something like that, as well as having ventilation or clean air in and out of your shop. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna go over here, and you can check this out in the workbook, we're gonna go over tungsten preparation in your torch. 
Now, obviously there are different types of preparations that you can use, all kinds of different uses that you would use them for. But the reason that I use a tungsten preparation with a ball on the end of it, and again, this is just personal preference, is that this type of electrode preparation is gonna withstand a little bit of inaccuracy with your balance setting much better. Like we talked about earlier when we set up our machine a little earlier in this episode, the balance setting is very important and it will help to keep the shape of your tungsten as you are welding. If you do not have a balance setting that's correctly set up, the tip of your tungsten is gonna become misshapen, it's gonna flutter, and it's gonna get wrecked really quickly. Welding with a ball preparation on the end of your tungsten will withstand any inaccuracy much better. So essentially, you can get welding a lot faster and your tungsten will not misshape or distort, and you'll be able to do more welding. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna go over here is material that we're gonna use for this demonstration. The thickness of this material here is 1 8 of an inch or 3.2 millimeters. This is gonna be a 5,000 series of aluminum pretty simple stuff and as you can see these coupons that I'm using are a little bit smaller than usual I like using these ones that are easy to practice with before we get going we want to make sure that we properly clean these with acetone or some kind of cleaning solution like that you're gonna to want to make sure that everything is properly wire brushed with a stainless steel wire brush that is only used for aluminum that's important and the next part that I'm gonna go over in this book might be some of the most important stuff that we go over here right now check this out we're gonna go over our body posture as we're getting ready to weld weld. And yes, my friend, this is so important. How many tutorials have you ever watched on YouTube that goes in depth on this stuff? Not a lot, probably. Well, except for my channel, I talk about this all the time. Okay, so take a look at this diagram right here. You can see here, as I'm set up for welding the outside corner joint, you can see I'm looking pretty comfortable. I'm not crunched up super close to my welding area. But the most important thing you can see from this angle here is I have my head positioned near the end of the pass. I don't have my head in front of the joint or anything like that. When you're positioned at the end of the joint like this, you can see everything thing much more clearly. Taking a look at my body position here as I'm set up at my table from the side, you can see that my mid forearm is actually anchored to the table. This is going to allow you to pivot a lot easier. This is pretty common right here. Avoid doing this. You can see in this clip here that my hand is attached to the table right here. This may seem a lot comfier at first. That's why a lot of people do it. But as you look at it here, you can see how much more of a limited range of motion I have. I absolutely recommend that when you get set up, you set up with the middle of your forearm being anchored to your table like this. And again, just make sure you take the time to get comfortable and you can move freely. Okay, so here's the next thing that we need to check out in the workbook. Take a look. On this page here, we're gonna go over our filler material angles. This is extremely important. Take a look at this diagram right here. You can see that my travel angle of my torch is approximately 15 degrees, give or take here. And you can see that the filler material is approximately 90 degrees from this angle. Like I said, pretty much no matter what joint you're doing, this is always gonna be a good rule of thumb to keep. Another thing that you can see here is that I am feeding in line with the pass direction. I'm not feeding from the side like this. You always wanna make sure that you're feeding in the direction that you are going to be traveling. Okay, now it's time to weld this together, let's go. After I get set up, I'm gonna tack the joint together like this here. When I'm done, I wanna make sure that the plates are lined up properly. I don't want any overlapping of the plates. I don't want any gaps anywhere. I don't want anything crooked at all as far as alignment. Now, when I'm happy with the alignment, check this out. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to do my real tacks. Yep, that's right. These first ones that you saw here are basically only meant to hold the joint together, that's it. So here we go, check this out. So I'm actually starting a couple real tacks that are essentially more like small welding passes. There's a lot that I could go over as far as why I do this. I teach this to students in my online TIG welding program in way more depth. But to keep this short here today, we just wanna make sure that we leave a little bit of extra filler material on either end of the joint that we will not melt, very important. This is going to help to prevent overheating as well as preventing the joint from popping open or shifting as we start welding. So now that we got all these fellas perfectly done and I'm happy with them, ready to go, I'm now going to get set up at my table with the posture and angles that we talked about earlier. And once I'm comfortable, ready to go, let's weld. Okay, as I get going here, I am going to focus on a good patient start. No hurry. I'm going to add a good amount of filler material right away, but not too much. I'm going to let things blend in nice and smooth, get nice and hot at the start. And then as I start traveling, I'm going to start with an easy rhythm. As I'm moving, I'm just keeping up a relatively tight stepping distance. The term stepping distance refers to the distance in between each step where filler material is added to the weld. 
Now, as I'm welding, I'm really watching my edges carefully and I want a smooth blend between the filler material and the base material. And I'm gonna show you a really crazy trick later in this episode about breaking down this detail. Stay tuned for that. Now, as I'm approaching the end of the pass here, we can see that things are getting really hot. So as I approach the end, I'm making sure that I'm prepared for the joint to be heating up and I wanna make any adjustments as things get spicy near the end here. I'm gonna increase my filler material slightly or decrease my heat or a combination of both of these things. Now, watch what I do when I finish here. Don't miss this. I'm gonna make sure that I properly post flow. I do not move my torch at all until the post flow cycle has finished running. This is gonna help to keep your tungsten nice and clean just the way it was when you started. Okay, let's take a look at the final results here. Looking at this, the first impressions of everything that I see look pretty good. We have a good finish, good consistency to everything. And after flipping the joint over, we can see proper penetration indicates the correct amount of heat input. But let's grab our workbook and break this down even more properly. You got your book? This section of the workbook has all of this stuff in it. Check it out. The first thing we're gonna look at is the overall consistency. Looking at the pass from start to finish, we obviously wanna see the details of our welding remain the same from the beginning of the pass all the way to the end. We don't want any areas that are wider or skinnier than others. We want it the same from start to finish. Taking a look at it here, we want consistent reinforcement. We don't want any high spots or low spots. We can see here that the amount of filler I used was pretty much perfect. Next up, we're gonna take a look at the stepping distance. Now we talked about the term stepping distance earlier. Look at the pattern of what we're doing right here. It looks pretty good. You can see the distance from each step that we took is relatively close, but more importantly, we can see the consistency of my stepping remains the same for the entire duration of the pass. Now you can use the pages in this workbook for virtually any joint that you're gonna do. You can use it for different plate configurations, coped pipe joints, all kinds of tricky stuff like that. And the next page in this book is gonna go over one of the biggest cheat codes that you're gonna find with TIG welding aluminum. Let's check it out. We are going to look at the cleaning action. Very important chapter in the book. Now this is what I'm talking about here when I refer to the cleaning action. It's this white snowy looking area right next to the welding pass right here. And essentially this is just the oxide that's been pushed aside by the cleaning side of the AC balance. There's a lot of different ways you could describe it, but that's kind of how I describe it there. Now as we travel along from the start of our weld to the finish of it, we want to see this area looking very consistent. We don't want any spots where the cleaning action is bigger than other areas. And we don't want it thinning out or diminishing as things get hot. We want the quality of our cleaning action nice and smooth as well. This is very important. We don't want any erratic stuff at all. Again, like I talked about, we don't want any areas where the cleaning action gets thinner as things get hot. Essentially, if you're seeing this start to occur, this means that you are running with excessive heat input. Now, for the next page in this workbook, this is another very important page I want you to check out. And this is the final detail of everything that you are gonna work on, ready? And this will be the ability to duplicate whatever you are doing consistently. Being able to get a really good weld after a lot of practice is a great feeling for sure. But then the goal becomes to repeat this process over and over with the same results each time. Being able to do it with different material thicknesses and doing it across different joint configurations in different positions, you get what I mean. For example, we could take the joint that we just did here like this, However, instead of doing it in a 45 degree position like we did, we can then tilt it up and try it in a 90 degree position. You can then take both of those examples, put them side by side, see how they compare to one another. We want all of the details that we're working on in this workbook to be repeatable. And this is gonna build an insane level of consistency and understanding with your work, no matter what joint or welding exercise you are practicing. Go get the workbook right now. The link is in the description below. It's completely free. You just put your email in, you download it, you can keep it forever, no catches. Enjoy, and make sure you do a random act of kindness for a stranger today. My name is Dusty James, Phil and Chill. We will talk soon, peace.